Coming up on Smart Tech Today, Matthew Casanelli and I have an update about Amazon Sidewalk before we talk about some new things coming to Amazon's Echo shows. Then we talk a little bit about some of the other smart assistants and smart home device makers before we round things out with everything you need to know about Smart Home and WWDC. There's so much to talk about, so stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by Audible. For a limited time, Amazon Prime members can save 53% on four months of Audible. That's only $6.95 a month. Take advantage of this incredible limited time offer at audible.com slash STT. If you're listening after this limited time offer has expired and you're a new member, try Audible Plus for 30 days with a free trial at audible.com slash STT or text STT to 500-500. And by Hover. Whether you're a developer, photographer, or small business, Hover has something for you to expand your projects and get the visibility you want. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, the show where we explain the exciting, dynamic, and sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things and surrounding devices or uh, orbiting devices. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am your other host, Matthew Casanelli. I was thinking the border devices, uh, going with the <laughs> thread metaphor there. Uh, welcome back, <laughs> Matthew. Thanks to Rosemary for stepping in last week while you were gone. I hope you um, had a great time. Uh, I think you talked about yeah. it on the show, so it's safe to talk about that you got to see family, which is awesome. And uh, it was amazing. <laughs> I just seeing or hearing my nephew call me Uncle Matthew was like soul healing <laughs> after the year. And then. Um, I was going to say I did I did so many ultra wide videos of him. It was awesome. Just like getting a full perspective of what we were doing and things like that. So that was really nice. And also nice. enjoyed listening to the episode. It was uh, interesting. It was good to hear Rosemary's perspective, especially on like Amazon sidewalk being she's like, I'm already surveilled everywhere I go. So it's yeah, not as much of a big deal here. I didn't know that about here. the UK. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's like I rem- I, I, I'm. I know about that, but I just haven't thought about how pervasive it is, too. Um, and I guess theirs is not opt out either. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And, and you know, so we'll start the show by talking about Amazon Sidewalk, because when Rosemary and I talked about it last, um, it was going to be coming out. It launched on June 8th. And it's important to understand that Amazon Sidewalk is not... Um, it's not a surveillance tool. It is not a uh, individual data tracker. It is not any of those things. And Amazon's doing what it can. Doing, yeah, it's it is doing what it can to make sure that people understand that and know that that it is very specifically designed with privacy in mind in a very particular way to make sure that people's privacy is respected while making this tool available and. It's see if I think if Apple had launched so, and and you know I'm not trying to be an Apple lover here I'm being genuine about the way that these things are perceived based on the company if Apple had launched something like this which they kind of did with um, with their Find My network there was a focus on um, individual. Uh, issues where you would have see this is what I find fascinating is that there was this focus on um, stalkers and and you know bad actors who would individually use this technology for for uh, bad purposes. But what didn't happen was it did not focus on Apple. There wasn't this this uh, you know this suspicion of Apple and you know Apple's going to be tracking you everywhere you go because Apple has not only, put out there that it is a privacy minded and privacy protecting company, but it also backs that up in every instance that it possibly can come along Amazon 
And because of its previous issues in, in privacy, some perceived and some actual, and because of its uh, lack of, of explanation of this feature, doing a good job of explaining this feature. Like if I was Amazon, I would have sent out my Amazon PR folks to go have conversations on podcasts about Amazon Sidewalk, to go talk to uh, tech blogs, to make sure that Good Morning America doesn't do an article on Amazon Sidewalk before it comes out that has somewhat true information but doesn't have the full story. Like all of those things happened because Amazon didn't do a good job of communicating what Amazon Sidewalk was, aside from folks who, like us, go and do our research. That's the problem. You have got to communicate these things and you've got to make sure that people understand what it is and what it's not, because then it leads to, you know, what we can joke about, well, you know, you're surveilled in the UK, so no biggie here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Then we know that when we're making those jokes, that it's like it's it's mostly a joke and that it's not saying that Amazon Sidewalk is a surveillance tool. But by the time all of that information gets filtered to GMA, the mass media uh, publication and, and you know, uh, network, by that time, those jokes are lost and like a bad game of telephone, it gets put out to the public <laughs> that way and with that understand with that lack of understanding. And so I really think that 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 is a that's an issue with this because after last episode of Smart Tech Today, I actually decided I'm gonna turn on Amazon Sidewalk because I want to try it first of all and see how it works and see um, if it's you know does what it what it says on the tin and whether it's good. Um, but I think that a lot of people are going to hear about this and they're immediately, uh, it's going to be a scare, scare tactic kind of thing where people don't really understand what they are or aren't opting out or into and thereby they make uh, a poorly informed decision uh, regarding it. So yeah, mm -hmm. I just, I'm bummed at Amazon for not handling this the right way. I agree. Uh, like, I put in my notes, I was like, Amazon is kind of doing the right thing now, but it almost doesn't matter. And it's like the same thing where I just saw headlines from like NBC News saying like, you need to opt out of Amazon's network that's tracking you and just that it's gotten fully away from them. And even just um, the other thing from last week of like, they're making their police request public. It does seem like they're at least stepping out of the shadows, whether or not they're doing the right thing is still... I guess I'm up to interpretation, but I do think it's, it, I think the most interesting part about the story is the way it's gotten away from them and become like the, the perception is lagging behind what they're actually doing that is improving it. Um, so yeah, I thought that was just kind of a funny shift. Um, and so that, yeah, that's officially out now so you can opt in or out. Yeah. Again, I don't think it's as big of a deal as it even initially seems and I do think how they approached it is more of the problem um, but what how people interpret that is is going to be up to them um, yep some other stuff too that they just are rolling out this week like the new echo show 8 and some of that ambient condition uh, lighting condition features that it has are being activated and also some of the zoom um, literal zoom but then also like panning in and out on video calls is going to be activated i think one that i didn't realize that they had that's kind of cool is just the shared home screen so you could kind of set a photo and then their example is like updating grandma's um i guess their photo album on this on the screen but just like if you could share just have the same one throughout all your houses with like the latest photo from your nephew, for example, would be a good example <laughs> that I would personally find relevant. Um, and then they also have some of the like fake background stuff that you can do and reactions while you're on calls. So I'm not sure how many people, it, it does seem nice, like a nonverbal way to interact without actually turning off your mic and saying something if you're doing lots of group stuff. So it's some kind of quality of life things for Amazon smart displays there, which is nice. Yeah. Um, that so the the little you can tap essentially to turn on or to to activate some of these um, uh, reactions, and I I think every every system that makes 
video conferencing needs to have those virtual backgrounds at this point. Um, FaceTime, you need to get on it because uh, we haven't seen those yet. We, the most we have will be portrait mode in iOS 15. Um, but I think that virtual backgrounds are well liked uh not hmm. only for the the sake of you know the fun of it, but also because it does make people more likely to want to uh, turn on their camera and converse with people where they don't feel like they need to, uh, you know, set it up and get the the scene just right. Um, yeah. All right. Up next, I like this one um, simply because it is kind of revolutionary to have a speaker that isn't also a smart speaker in the year of someone's Lord 2021. Um, IKEA has an Enabe uh, Bluetooth <laughs> speaker and its purpose is to just be a Bluetooth speaker, not to be a Bluetooth smart speaker. Yeah, exactly. Their whole take is just that it's it never listens to you, and that's why they love it. Um, and it's, I think this is, I can't remember who, is this in line with, uh, when did Am or Ikea start, Ikea, um, start getting this sort of fancy fabric design? It's very minimalist, the, not that they've always been minimalist, but I thought it was related to teenage engineering, or maybe that was just one of their speakers. Um, but yeah, since I'm not then, sure. they've had, yeah. This whole line just looks awesome. So it's just a speaker with a it's handle gorgeous. and a dial on the front. Um, and it's only 50 bucks. Uh, it, it is wired, which they're like, there is one thing that it's actually kind of rare to have a Bluetooth speaker that you don't need to constantly plug in. Um, like it is plugged in, but you don't need to constantly recharge it. And then there's also a removable battery pack that you can get it. So it can be wireless too. Um, these are sweet. Like I want to do... I think I've seen just so many of these roll out that it is like having a whole Ikea. Oh, it was Sonos, I think, was what they were doing originally. Um, just like there are a whole line of speakers throughout the house that doesn't even look like speakers. I mean, this one does, but it's still less so than a traditional one. It's kind of just like a like lunchbox, boombox sort of situation going on. Um, but yeah, these are nice. Good little article from the Input Magazine. Uh, next, the Google Nest Hub and Nest Hub Max um, are getting a keyboard, which might seem odd to you, and a browser so that you can browse on these large screen devices. It kind of makes sense. It's almost like turning, uh, it's like bringing back the, the family computer in a way. Uh, you usually would use those family computers just to quickly look something up or, you know, it's sat next to a phone or, or something like that. And you could just Google something or, you know, pop over to a web page. And so now with the Google Nest Hub and Nest Hub Max, you can use it a little bit like a computer, but you can browse. Yeah. This is the extent of it. It does seem like it's mostly for the situations where you would instead just run into like an error and it would stop. It's like it can kick open to a browser and actually still show you the results. And then like if you really need to type in, um, I assume they're not like having people going up to the screen and typing with their hands vertically because that's, I, I used to do that with the iPad and I had a lot of ergonomic issues. So like, I mean, obviously this isn't the same thing at all, but it is just funny to imagine you actually trying to, it's like, hold on, I'm writing my school paper on the Nest Hub. Didn't um, <laughs> uh, Steve Jobs famously talk about like gorilla hand or something? Oh, yeah. Typing exactly on a screen like that that's vertical in yeah. front of you. Yeah, just like having your it's wrist up in the air. <laughs> not, not too comfortable. Um, I, I was wondering, I don't think this is the first Nest Hub is the one that has Fuchsia now. And I was like, I was wondering if this just was made possible or maybe made easier or more seamless in the future by having that underlying operating system too. That like if you could pair a Bluetooth keyboard with it or something, it could be a tiny little screen. I don't know. That's less, that sounds more of just a, like a ease of development thing for them as opposed to the actual user side of it. But I just thought it was interesting. Like those are going to be getting more and more different features as we go. Um, and then, Microsoft is building Xbox game streaming into smart TVs. This is an interesting, uh, an interesting situation here because, as we talked about before, with game streaming, um, one of the beautiful benefits of this is that you get to have these devices um, 
or not have these devices, but have these titles that you can play across all sorts of devices. So it doesn't matter what device you're using. All that matters is that you are playing, you know, the game that you want to play on whatever screen you want to use. Yeah, exactly. And it seems they're like building it into either the smart TV operating system or they're doing a streaming stick that you would plug in. And so it'll still all cast from, I think, I think the big thing that they announced too was that all of the games, the xCloud stuff will now run on Xbox Series X as opposed to the current. I think they only run on Xbox Ones. So it's like not the best experience possible. Um, So that should help too. But then just having that actual streaming stick that you could update over time with more power as opposed to whatever is built into your TV makes a lot of sense. And it's not like running on the TV itself. But yeah. I I feel validated that we started talking about game streaming like six months ago, I think. And because it is very much quickly became part of the smart home and part of those offerings. And so it is like now you if you could just play Xbox on any TV in your house, that is just like a much smarter experience than being connected from an HDMI cable just to, directly to one. Like I've redesigned my whole setup just so I could play games in a specific spot. And if I didn't have to do that, that'd be awesome. So I think this is very cool. It's a very, I do want to see if it's just fast enough because that's still, I tried doing it from my Xbox one on my iPad and I just like played like for like three minutes and just shut it off. I was like, Nope, that's not going to work at all. <laughs> like, or I tried to um, I tried to use the backbone controller for the phone to uh-huh. do it remotely, and those don't have the same sensitivity on the sticks. And so I think I mentioned it on the show, but I was playing Apex Legends, and I was like trying to shoot, and I'd be like, and just like completely turn around, and I was like, oh my god, if I was my ally watching me, I would be so upset <laughs> because it's just like your teammates just like, what's going on? Like oh, it's like, no. oh my lord, so. Uh, we'll see, but still for, I think a good amount of gaming experiences, it still will be really nice. Um, I did manage to get a Xbox series X order in earlier this week. And so I'm getting one, which is cool. Yeah. It's, I've got this person, um, on Twitter notifications and like every day or every time for the last like three weeks, I've been like, ah, entering your information. So (laughs) it's amazing that they're still not in stock. And it yeah, came out all in this October time of last year. Wow. I think there's only like six games that are new for it anyways, but my whole Xbox thing broke. So I will be back up to 4K gaming, which I was not. And I'm still convinced has made me worse since then. So I'll, <laughs> I'll do the tests and see. That's real proof that the latency stuff does actually matter. But <laughs> we'll see. My controller sticks. That's one of the worst parts is like, this is very esoteric, but if I have a burst gun in that game, I will regularly shoot once and then my controller will be stuck and then I can't like shoot again and stuff. So it's, it's pretty, oh, no. pretty janky. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I have like glasses taped together or something like that. <laughs> uh, all righty. Um, and let's see what's next. Oh. Uh, we have talked before about Sensibo's brand or Sensibo and, um, Sensibo has an air purifier and it has a new product out. Well, no, it's not a new product, but it's, uh, it's the, the air purifier that Sensibo makes that now features home kit integration. So you can use it in your home kit home. So think about the integrations there where, or automations there, where, uh, if you've got a, a, an air sensor in your house um, in a specific room that can tell, oh, the CO2 levels, are, well, not CO2 because that wouldn't make sense for this, but particulate levels are high, uh, then it will turn on the Sensibo air purifier and get things cleaned up. That's nice. Yeah, these seem nice. And again, I'm still preemptively looking at these a lot more in detail because we have seen there's some charts going around about how the entire like Southwest of the United States is already in extreme drought and uh, it's not looking for California this year of (sighs) forest fire and smoke and things like that. So there's a real chance that I'm going to absolutely need this humidifier or uh, air purifier. purifier. Um, Yeah. Later this summer. So I hope uh, uh, as late as possible. Gosh. 
<laughs> we'll be talking about air quality again on this podcast at some point this year. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, all right, let's see. Let's go ahead and uh, take a quick break because I got to tell you about one of my favorite things, one of my all-time favorite things. It's Audible. And Audible is bringing you this episode of Smart Tech Today. That's right. Forget about last summer. It's all about this summer. We've all been inside long enough. So grab, oh my gosh, this sounds amazing. Grab some beach towels, stock the cooler, and make your escape. It's time to celebrate the best season of the year like never before. Can you imagine just kicked back on the beach listening to an audio book with a cooler full of your beverage of choice right there? Ah, that nice sea breeze. Man, that sounds, oh man, I want to go do that right now. I got I to gotta get out of here. Uh, with so many great stories and programs, Audible is the perfect summer partner. And now is the absolute best time to do it because Prime members can save 53% off their first four months. That's right. With Audible, you can listen to more of whatever you're into because Audible has it all. An unbeatable selection of audiobooks, tons of binge-worthy podcasts and exclusive originals, all available to download or stream. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month, like the latest bestseller or hottest new release, yours to keep forever. But here's the best part. You also get access to Audible's streaming library, the Plus Catalog. You can discover your next podcast obsession, check that audiobook off your bucket list, or get lost in a world of original content from celebrity creators, best-selling authors, and leading experts, the kind of stuff you can't hear anywhere else. Stream all you want as much as you want. Audible is the perfect companion for summer because no matter where you're going or what you're doing, you'll always have just the right thing to listen to at your fingertips. It's perfect for road trips, lazy beach days, long bike rides, or just barbecuing in the backyard. I love Audible. It is uh, my way of escaping <laughs> uh, to another world. And in fact, I'm listening to a new title now. Uh, it's called The Shadow of What Was Lost by James Islington. And um, I'm not very far into it, but I really like to find new series whenever I can so that I can listen to uh, many an audiobook. After I am finished with one, I can move on to the, the next one. And I really like fantasy. And uh, this falls squarely within that realm. So, uh, so far, so interesting. And it's basically like when I, my ears and my brain aren't needing to be used for other things, I will listen to Audible audio books. Now, you out there right now for a limited time, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can save 53% on four months of Audible. That's only $6.95 a month. If you're not an Amazon Prime member, what are you waiting for? Go to Amazon and sign up so you can get this deal and so much more. My goodness, so much more with Amazon Prime. Get more out of summer with Audible. To take advantage of this incredible limited time offer, go to audible.com slash STT. If you're listening after the limited time offer has expired and you're a new member, try Audible Plus for 30 days with a free trial at audible.com slash STT or text STT to 500-500. Thanks so much to Audible for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today and keeping my ears filled with great content. We appreciate you. All righty. It's uh, time to talk a little bit about WWDC and some of the stuff that was announced. Um, up first is an article from The Verge talking about elder care technology because there were several new features that Apple announced, including walking gait and uh, health sharing that are all about elder care technology. And we've seen a lot of the big names in um, smart tech covering elder care tech. And I, I, I'm happy about that. Yeah, it is interesting. They didn't they didn't actually say this, say that it was for elder care specifically, I think, cuz I was noticing no. I was trying to like it, that's the Verge's take on it, but I thought it was interesting as I was watching it cuz I was both paying attention to that cuz I did actually sorry, I'm checking the app on my phone. Um I just visited my grandma who has been having like mobility issues and so it is like actively measuring this stuff on a daily basis really would make a difference and just understanding how she's doing and things like that. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I was just trying to figure out for myself, 
I have like weird gait things where like I think I don't walk totally perfectly. And so I am curious if it could help me analyze that kind of thing. And oh yeah, I got to just wa- walking steadiness notifications. Um, so I think that's more like if you're, yeah, it's, it's generally got uh, designed to see that if you're going to fall within the next 12 months, it says. Um, so it is more designed specifically for limited mobility as opposed to just general analysis of that. Um, but I think this stuff is really cool. And you guys were talking last week about, um, the 24 seven health monitoring service and things like that. So I think this all kind of falls in line with that. And Apple's very honed in on the, um, health stuff now with Apple watch specifically. One of the cool things too is, um, the ability to share your data specifically with somebody so like in that same example, I could actually just check on my grandma like every single day how, she, how she's doing without her going in and screenshotting it and sending it to me or something like that. Like I even had a shortcut that I built earlier this year that used that take screenshot to open into the health app and take screenshot and send it to somebody. So like that's very specifically something that people are trying to do. And obviously this being built into the OS is going to be a lot better feature there. Um I bet. <laughs> Not that my parents are elderly in any way. Um, I was referring to my grandma, but it is, I think that's something funny. It's like, I want to track it with my parents over time and be like, hey, you guys should go more walks or something. But <laughs> <laughs> it's still like, that was the reason I got them both Apple into Apple Watch in the first place was sort of the health angle that it's just a daily thing that can help you make those choices differently. And so... <laughs> just I'm gonna needle them if I get this and be like, hey, you should go on more walks, mom. <laughs> this is why but I'll so, never I share mean, my health data with anyone ever. I mean, it's your family is of anybody should be the people who are encouraging you to be healthy and things like that. So maybe not actually needling, but just positive encouragement or something. Ah, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> that 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 feels better. Um, then we find our national. Nightmare. Our long national nightmare is over. Uh, not truly, but uh, in iOS, <laughs> or excuse me, in in the next version of TVOS, um, Apple is trying to make it even easier for you to log into your devices, uh, into your apps on TVOS. The reason why I say not really or not actually is because uh, developers of those TVOS apps will still have to enabled this feature. And if there's any uh, developer that is sluggish, it is on the whole, the tvOS developer, because it's typically big companies <laughs> that are creating tvOS apps, and uh, they take their time on rolling out any updates. And sometimes they roll out updates that suck. And so they roll <laughs> back those updates like a certain HBO Max I know. That's so I yeah. I'm glad I was on vacation specifically for that week because I didn't actually run into that. And when I went back in, it was working again. So oh, it, nice. like they got rid of all of the custom controls. And I th- what didn't it restart the movie anytime you stopped it or something like that? I never used it. Uh, I just have only had only heard about it. So uh, I saw yeah, but like I avoided their it too. engineers publicly <laughs> apologized for it because they're like, sorry, <laughs> we're, uh, we're working on it. So but the password thing is awesome. Um I'm curious how there is a whole new sign in with your Apple device thing and Apple's sort of moving away from passwords as a way to sign in the stuff because it's like you're already authenticated in your device and nobody wants to remind remember your password. So I'm curious how and like see passwords get, get stolen. Here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe uh, maybe that's how they get Netflix into this is that you have to sign in with individual devices. And so they know who's signed in and not sharing passwords or something like that. I guess that was, that was worse for HBO before than Netflix always kind of encouraged accounts. But specifically, if Netflix holds out on this, I'm going to be bummed because I've had to re-sign into the Netflix app every single time I've used it for the last six months and I can't figure out why. And what? So, yeah, like That's this obnoxious. is something I should blog about or something because it is like every time we use it, it just signs us out. I don't know why. Um <laughs> <laughs> That's awful. Yeah, it's brutal. Um, I, thankfully, the auto password thing, like when it prompts that, I get a notification on my phone. And then when I go into that field, it'll fill in my password from the save passwords. So it's 
it's pretty much already doing this. And now it could just like scan my face too, or do that signing with device thing. So in theory, they'd just fix it. Um, but this will, this is a welcome change until then, <laughs> which is just like the whole OS fixes it before they actually update. I don't know. Netflix, I don't think has a great relationship with Apple TV specifically, probably because they became exact competitors with it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, there's a couple other stuff for TVOS, but, um, not a whole lot. I think the main thing is also, um, it's kind of confusing because there's a new spatial audio feature for Apple music and Apple TV and for regular audio on your phone. And it's all bundled under the term spatial audio. Um, and I don't, I don't think we talked about this too much. It's not like super smart home related cause it's technically not on the home pods, even though I, I thought what the home pod does is kind of like spatial audio on its own. Um, that exact overlap I wasn't super clear about, especially since the home pods technically discontinued now. Um, but in general, the cool thing is that this is getting added to Apple TV and it will do a whole process where it basically sim it can kind of determine whether or not you're looking in one direction for a consistent amount of time. And then it assumes that that's looking at the TV. And then it's like if you get up and go to the bathroom or something like that, it'll sort of turn it off. It'll uh, phase it out slow, real quick um, and then it'll turn it off. And then once you go back, it'll kind of figure out okay, you're looking in this direction. So now if you turn your head slightly left and right, it'll space it all around you. Um, it's a pretty, I don't know if you tried it too, but it's a pretty weird thing. Even the spatialized stereo feature for AirPods would let you take basically yeah. this podcast and make it sound like we're in a room talking to each other. And it's actually pretty cool. I don't yeah, think it worked great. I used great it on uh, the other day while I was producing Windows Weekly and it was a bizarre experience. Pretty fun, but yeah. bizarre. It really does sound like they're in like the room with you in a certain way. And um, it's sort of hard to describe. But I think specifically with Apple Music Spatial Audio, which is generally Dolby Atmos um, as the like actual spec, is very interesting because it it's if you have the phone on, it will use that as like the basis for where you should be facing. But otherwise, it seems like there's almost this isn't relevant to everybody, but it's uh, from video production. It seemed like a gimbal that has sort of a slow pan where like if you turned your head, it would it would track that you're going left and right and you could kind of separate the sound. But if you turn your whole body, it will like shift the whole field with you slowly. Mm -hmm. So I always think of it as like a gimbal that's like you kind of catch up and then like match the person. And so it's, it's not jarring, but it, it's very subtle. And I don't know, it's pretty fascinating. Um, Apple executives are like, this is the biggest thing coming to, to music since high fidelity <laughs> audio or something like that, um, which is, it is pretty cool. Um, it's cool. And it makes me sort of check out my music that maybe I haven't listened to in a while. And so that part, I think that it, it becomes the biggest thing because it opens up the ability for folks to say, you listened to this album a hundred years ago, but we uh, got an artist in and they, you know, a, a remaster artist in who made it sound all new. And so in that way, I think that it is the biggest thing because we're going to hear old music in a new way. That Marvin Gaye song, is, that mm -hmm. is really cool. The Weeknd song, exactly. I couldn't tell the difference between the two, but the Marvin Gaye song <laughs> um, genuinely was such a cool experience hearing the two different versions. And... I, uh, as a, as an unabashed, unashamed Beyonce fan, I'm looking forward to Ooh, her music yeah. being remastered so that you can hear Beyonce singing like right into your ear with the music behind her. That's going to be so cool. Can't wait. Especially with the whole band. Um, I don't remember what you call that, but the, from her big show, it's like, yeah, if you like could really hear the, the whole separation and, uh, of, yeah, that'd be very cool. Um, I think it's also, it is like, leads into AR and VR stuff in the future of just being able to have the ship, whatever, fly over your head, kind of like, I mean, it's very much like surround sound for movies, but it also has a vertical element to it since it's just through these speakers and they can kind of simulate it. Um, it's pretty fascinating, but I think just it, it wasn't present on Apple TV. And so that was very weird, especially what's like 
you could buy an iPad and watch and have a better experience than the TV. I almost made a video on that at one point. Um, but so I think wearing AirPods or just headphones in general for smart home viewing is actually a thing that I see. I still see. I think I saw Justine being like, why would you ever do that? And I'm like, I've done it so much in the last year. It's my girlfriend will like watch a TV show and I'll like do something on my iPad and we can both listen with like full quality and not interrupt each other also. Not that that's like the best experience necessarily all the time, but if it you're is in a nice family to be able to sit like with that. the person, but be able to do your own thing. Yeah, totally. And, and just like in the future with any sort of augmented reality stuff, it's going to just be that more, more immersive than sounding like it's coming from two headphones in either of your ears. So pretty cool stuff. It's worth checking out. Um, I'm curious to see, I mean, 3d audio as a thing, I remember sort of scoffing at Amazon at, C, uh, at CES when they were showing it off because I just didn't, they're not as good at explaining it, I guess, than <laughs> the game changer <laughs> headline from the EDQ. So <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of, it's always interesting. And it's one of those things too that you really do have to experience to get it. And so that's why they've got, it's all over Apple Music right now of like, check out these playlists in spatial audio. I listened to Sweet Child of Mine and that was pretty good. It does like, I mean, I used to play in bands and so it does sound like you're kind of like on stage with them and um, it does make me want to like listen to live music or go go listen to music again more. So it is cool. That's always important because music can be really powerful. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Um, what's next? Oh, the, the tidbits section, talking about some of the updates to iOS uh, 15 that uh, you may have missed, including a redesign of the built-in Apple TV remote on your iPhone. Um, the ability to, I think this is a cool one, when someone goes to set up a new phone and they don't have enough iCloud storage to make the, the change and sort of get the update going and, and complete the whole process, uh, Apple will temporarily loan them a, the amount of data that they need in the cloud, in iCloud, in order to make that swap. And then I think it's for like two weeks that they have it so that they can get everything ironed out. Uh, and then one of my favorites, which is that EXIF metadata is finally in the Photos app. You used to have to use a third-party app in order to view the EXIF data. Now that's all available from within the Photos app. And I love it! Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's all nice. The so storage thing is really good for upgrading your devices. Um, I don't really understand the remote redesign. There's like a channels button in it, but I don't have channels on my TV. And even Apple TV as a thing doesn't really, maybe that's a referring to your assign, assume like you're using Apple TV channels, which is like their subscription thing in there for that you can subscribe directly to Disney Plus. Um, and it just puts all the buttons in a different location. So it's kind of like what? They already moved the buttons on the remote itself, and now the power is in the bottom left instead of bottom right. I don't know. I, I think that should get changed. Um, but yeah. Um, and then the other thing too with, I mean, there's another article linked in here about iCloud Plus, which is Apple's weird rebranding of what iCloud already is to sound like it's better. Um, because technically, there's a free version of iCloud that only gets five gigabytes of storage, so that's that's now just iCloud, and then iCloud Plus is what you might have already been paying for. Um, but the big, they do have a whole, it's kind of like a VPN, but it's called Private Relay, so it's not technically. Um, and they have some of what they've been doing with Hide My Email so that you can send like dummy email addresses. Might be good for smart home type stuff too. Um, but the big one is that now it's, I think, unlimited home ca camera storage where you used to be limited to like five or I think 20 on the maximum plan. Um, but if you had any more than that, you were just out of luck. And so now it's kind of like everybody, home kit camera storage for everybody. So they're not kind of weirdly limiting it when there's no other solution there too, which is nice. And then, and then I think the last kind of just accessory type thing, but we're going to get to home kit and Siri. And of course, uh, I'll say shortcuts in a minute too, but, um, the last cool benefit is just with AirPods, they don't have the exact Find My, um, they don't have any sort of U1 finding, but now they'll actually make noise, 
which I thought was always funny that it's like you could never just have your AirPods make noise in the case where they were or like if it was out of the case, it would work. And it was very specific situations. So now you can actually like see exactly where your AirPods are. I think it or not exactly. I'll say <laughs> not yeah. compared to the AirTags, but um, it'll like chirp and I, I assume the chirping helps it determine exactly where it is from the sound effect itself and then um send you closer and things like that but that's really nice oh yeah um and the bluetooth ambient um, noise reduction to all that is going to be good bluetooth can help a little bit with it as well oh yeah that's right it was bluetooth um what was the other one i just tried it actually the separation alert on the air uh, air tag Oh, I guess yeah, it does for AirPods that's Pro too. a big thing we should talk yeah. about. Yeah. So air tags and your iPhone and um, your Apple Watch. And I can't remember if they're if they're even more than that, but certainly those devices, your Apple Watch would hardly ever be an issue. But in case it is, um, you can turn on a feature, a setting within Find My that says, if I am separated from this device, meaning if I move far enough away from this device, send me a notification letting me know, hey, silly, you've you've left this behind. And it also lets you set up locations where you don't want that. So for example, if I leave my um, if I leave my I'm trying to think of what makes sense here, my backpack at work and I are at home, I guess, and I leave, it's likely that I was not trying to bring my backpack with me. So I put my home location as one place where if I'm separated from it, don't worry about it. But then you can you can add more, remove some, however you want to do it so that the devices that you don't want to leave behind, you'll get notified for. This is excellent. Yeah, this is great. I'm looking at it again. Yeah, because I tried it. I turned it on and forgot about it and then went on a walk earlier and it notified me. And so I do think specifically for the home, the default location is pretty small and I'm actually going to set it, I think, to like my whole larger neighborhood because then I can go on a walk at home or in the neighborhood without it going off. But it is like if I drive away, it, this is a really great feature because I was even when I was like on the trip, I we, I was taking my bag out of my car because I'm still scarred for life from getting everything stolen out of my car that one time. Um, so even in like uh, rural California and like a small town along the um, avenue of the Giants, which are all the redwood trees, I'm like taking my backpack out into the restaurant just in case somebody <laughs> breaks in, which is not never going to happen there. Um but like I specifically was like, I don't want to leave my bag here because that's an easy thing. It's like, even though I take it with me, now I have to remember to bring it back to the car. And so I could have had that on. And it's like, as we drive away, it's like, hey, you left your bag there. It's as opposed to a day and a half later that it was going to notify you otherwise. So this was very well, very much needed for AirTags. Yep. Um, and then... Uh, I already uh, covered the iCloud, so yeah. Yeah, that's true. I did want to touch on that. Um, in early features, it's there's still some work uh, to be ironed out. Obviously, this is all still in beta, uh, but I do think that that iCloud storage, iCloud Plus plan, particularly the fact that you can go unlimited with your HomeKit secure video cameras, will be of interest to our Smart Tech Today audience. Um, Outside of that, it's, you know, a lot of uh, Apple specific stuff that uh, you may or may not want to to check out. But uh, we'll see how those features kind of work out in the end uh, before we, we get there. All right. Let's see. Um, it feels like it might be too soon to uh, head to a break. But... Um, Oh, I know. I'll, I'll mention this briefly uh, before we head to a break. Uh, there was another feature that was announced that I would like to see um, all devices across every system take advantage of, which is the devices, the uh, your iPhone, your iPad, other devices that have Find My built in, um, being able to hold on to just a tiny bit of juice so that even if they're oh, completely yeah. powered off, um, they can still be found with the Find My Network. That is kind of amazing because uh, having had my iPad stolen in the past and knowing that 
part of the reason it was never recovered was because the battery ran dead and uh, it was having trouble getting signal. This this is a big deal, uh, this change, to be able to find it um, even if the battery is run dead or if somebody tries to you know power it down or what have you, that they may think that it's, you know, locked and secured and then, you know, they can get away with it, but, uh, it can still be traced and tracked even after the power has, uh, has gone out from it. So I think that's a really cool feature. Yeah, this is nice for sure. And it, um, I may or may not have the beta on my phone already and it's causing some battery life issues. So I will say I've already tested this because my phone died yesterday and it's probably going to die soon again. Um, and it does just like, as you power it off, it just says your phone can still be located using the find my network so i wonder if even i mean this isn't just about battery dying too it is just about people turning off the device so mm-hmm. it's like if that's a common thing it's like the second you find an iphone that if you were gonna steal it it's like just turn it off and they can't find it anymore but now it could actually help find it even if they try to turn it off so i'm curious how long this lasts oh it says several more hours i guess um and it also keeps working while the phone is reset to factory settings with the activation lock enabled. So it's like if they, um, that's why every time you like trade in your phone, you have to go in and manually turn off activation lock. And it's like if they reset it without that, it'll still know that that's your phone. So it's good to actually really help with stolen items as much as lost ones too. And it, it seems like it's using the same thing as the um, transit cards, which can also, you can also scan in and out of like, the BART station in the Bay Area once your phone is dead, which I had happened to me in the past. So <laughs> pretty nice. All right. Um, yeah, let's go ahead now and take a quick break before we come back with um, the most exciting uh, stuff from WWDC, at least for this show, um, as we talk about shortcuts and some of the awesome stuff to happen with uh, Thread and matter and uh, all that all that jazz Uh, but i do want to tell you about hover who are uh, gracefully gratefully wonderfully bringing you this episode of smart tech today it's time to make plans and let hover help you achieve them if you're a blogger if you're creating a portfolio if you're building an online store or if you just want to make a more memorable redirect to your linkedin page well hover has the best domain names and email addresses just for you email at your domain name is key to connecting with customers and building trust for your brand they have domain based emails for all your needs small or large and it's so easy to set it up you can add as many mailboxes to your domain as you need when your domain renews your mailboxes will too The prices are unbeatable. Their most popular mailbox is a no-brainer solution for business owners. And you can get access from anywhere. Use the email app you're already comfortable with. Or if apps aren't your thing, well, just use their webmail uh, because it can be accessed wherever you are. I... Am a, uh, <laughs> I am a hover fool. I have lots of hover domains and uh, regularly register new ones. And what I love about it is how easy it is to register domains. I just type in the search that I want and uh, I find the domain I'm looking for. And if I don't, then it gives me suggestions for domains that are a lot like the domain that I'm looking for. Um, it notifies me plenty of time ahead to let me know when it's uh, that a renewal is coming up. So I can go, oh yeah, I bought that that domain that I didn't really need, but I bought it. So at least I know I can cancel it if I don't want it. And I can, you know, add more if I choose to. And uh, one of my favorite things too is that uh, Hover supports Apple Pay. So it makes it very easy to buy domains. They've also got sales all the time. So you can find domains that are on sale, uh, top level domains that are on sale and quickly set something up. So, you know, go out there and find uh, find a domain for you. I uh, purchased a domain for my niece so that she could have that whenever she's older to do with whatever she wants if she wants to do anything with it um but yeah it's just it's so easy it's so easy and uh hover is one of the things that i love about hover is that 
they know you are the customer and they want you to just be the customer. They don't want you to be a source of data. You can take back control of your data with reliable tracker free email. Hover is trusted by hundreds of thousands of customers who use their domain names and email to turn their ideas into a reality. They're not going to upsell you. They just want to help. They have pro level tools including powerful domain and email management tools that are intuitive and easy to use, whether you're a web pro or you're just getting started. It's private and secure. That who is privacy is so important uh, because it protects your information. It's included with your domain purchase, and that means that your data will remain private. It's a great way to reduce spam and protect yourself from unwanted solicitations. And Hover Connect lets you pick the service you want to use to build and host your website. That's a really awesome feature where you can just go in and say, yeah, I want to set this up with my uh, this account. I want to set this up with this. And, you know, a few clicks. Connect helps you start using your domain name with just a couple of clicks. Whether you're a developer, a photographer, or a small business, Hover has something for you to expand your projects and get the visibility you want. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year. And of course, we thank Hover for their support of this show. Thank you, Hover. We love you. All righty, Matthew. Uh, Apple had several announcements related to the home. And iMore put together a list of the different announcements that Apple made regarding the home in the presentation. And then you've been doing some further research. I thought it was tomorrow, but it was today, some of the stuff that I was wanting to take a look at. So you had a chance to check it out. I will be checking it out after the show. Uh, but let's start mm -hmm. with the stuff that Apple did announce at WWDC from this iMore article. Yeah, so... This is mostly just the home stuff too, but um, and we'll cut. We've covered a bit of it too, but um, one of the cool things is home keys. So, in the wallet app, um, and I think this is. I'm assuming this is using the U1 thing. I don't. Although I don't think they very clearly specified. Um, maybe it is NFC as well, but um, uh, you'll be able to basically create a home key that will access all of your smart locks and things like that just by tapping your phone or Apple Watch to the door and. I guess this isn't in this article too, but Apple's also doing um, like a smart ID program where they're actually working with the governments to use your actual official ID. Although this is this is totally one of those things where I'm like, both, I mean, I know that they have that thing that your phone, that's obviously completely important to this if you don't have your wallet <laughs> at all and just have your ID and your home keys in your phone itself. Um but this seems like one of those things that I really wouldn't want to try that much and would also still probably bring it anyways of like <laughs> just because of the, the one time it doesn't work. Oh, absolutely. You can't travel yeah, or you can't get in your oh. house. So, I mean, this is very, but also like technology should do this. This is the thing that everybody's always wanted. Um, so I think it's it's pretty cool. This is like ultimate smart home of lock up and just wave your arm and it does it right away and stuff like that. So. This is like I made a whole video specifically about this. I mean, it's, it was pretty obvious that it was coming for that part. Um, but I think just that spatial awareness stuff around all of this, all of these smart home products is going to be really important too, and being deeper integrated into the OS itself. Um, one thing that the second highlight, which I was very curious, we'll get to the Matter part in a second, but I'm very curious how this overlaps with Matter, is that Apple announced that Siri would be available for third-party accessories. And this was something that I was like, wow, I had no expectations that that was going to happen. Um, I don't exactly understand how it's going to work. Maybe actually there's probably a session about this. Um, but that sounds amazing. Just the ability to trigger, oh, there we go. Of course, trigger my iPad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just being able to make those same requests. Oh, yeah, I think actually, now that I think about it, it's going to field the queries and then route them back through your HomePod or something like that. Um, so it won't actually be full intelligence on that device, but it'll basically be the voice activation and just sort of smart assistant integration that people have come to expect from things like Amazon Echo or the Amazon Assistant, I'll just say. Um, so this is amazing. Like this is just very great. I think specifically for me too, being able to trigger shortcuts from another device would be really cool. Um, that's super interesting, just like any sort of smart home device. And 
all, all, we already talked about the home kit skier video or we can talk about it a little bit more, but I do want to just skip to the matter part real quick of you also are basically going to be able to use any smart home device through home kit. And there's a whole video session about it pretty much uses the exact APIs that home kit developers are currently using like Apple. Apple is developing matter as part of the partner in the open source program. And it was built off of home kit technologies. And so it really is, Literally, like if you had a HomeKit device already, you could integrate third-party devices using those same HomeKit APIs, and it'll just tap into the Matter APIs on the back end. And I think they're still actually technically even called Chip because they haven't updated the specific yeah. up, um, guidelines yet. But it was pretty. It took me a second watching it to recognize what that meant. That it really is, even just for setting up. Um, I'm trying to just think of, I was going to say a Google Home, but that's not right. Like, I guess a Nest Hub, you could set it up and you would go through the, like, what looks like the HomeKit scanning and setup process. And then the, all that whole UI will still be the same and it'll just get added to their application. And then at the end of the setup, it'll say, do you want to add this to Apple Home also? And so it does seem like, at least for iOS users, not only is it going to be interoperable, but it'll literally be set up all the same way as well, um, which will just be a lot less confusing. And then even in the home app, you can go in and see which um, services that a certain device is connected to through that same standard because it can detect where it's plugged in. And so you can basically see that like your Hue app is set up in HomeKit as well as Amazon on your Amazon Echo. Um, it's it's like it really is mind blowing because ultimately it means that any sort of smart accessory will work through the HomeKit interface. You'll be able to trigger shortcuts th for to to like turn on any sort of smart home device. That was where I was like, ooh, that's exciting. Like I could turn on my Nest Hub and watch YouTube videos. I mean, it depends on how much they support it specifically, but um, through through Siri or something like that, and then. Um, I think specifically with Matter too, is it supports um, custom features so that what and what that really means is just that while HomeKit already could support custom features, not all the third-party integrations could. And since Matter has support for that, anything that's built custom in there will also work through HomeKit. So it's kind of just like they keep saying it in the sessions, but it's like, it'll just work. And in theory, it actually really will. So it's, it's <laughs> going to be super interesting. Um, but it's, it's pretty, I think it's just going to, it almost seems like too good to be true. <laughs> right. That is, yeah, it does feel that way whenever you read about how this is meant to work and what it's supposed to do. And I, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful and I'm keeping an open mind about it because I think that, you know, we've talked about it for a long time, but I really do think that matter finally is truly, really, honestly, the thing that makes the smart home be something that anybody can get into because they don't have that purchasing fear of like, is this going to work with this or not? So, yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. They had some specific language in the session that was about like they, they want the person to be able to build to like build their smart home and add to it over time, not sort of pick one and switch back and forth or something like that. Um, so it does seem like they're all actually working together here. And one of the things that I'm going to be very interested in is just like, how do they differentiate? Because if Siri isn't actually, I mean, maybe the security part is still there, but if on a technical level, if Siri can do the same sort of smart home things that a Google thing can do and with the same products, that's when Google really does blow it out of the water because they're way better at Googling things and mm -hmm. finding search results that Siri will need to actually compete. Whereas maybe even by now not having that competition has made them just sort of like as good enough situation. And that's like veering slightly into the whole antitrust thing. But ultimately, that's kind of one of the problems. I still think like YouTube is worse in the smart home because Google limits it to their only de own devices and that's anti-competitive to me but because there's no other options anywhere else. So I feel like hopefully some of this will, I mean, maybe YouTube could be more possible throughout Matter. It's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. But seeing Apple like put all their wood behind this arrow is a good thing. Uh, oh, I like that. I like that saying. <laughs> I don't think I've heard that one before. 
um, yeah, I, I agree. I'm excited to watch that, uh, that those videos and see what, um, what the company, what Apple's saying so far and continuing to keep my eye out for, uh, other announcements that take place across the, the ecosystem there. Um, as more devices start to support it. It was interesting just today. Um, so Eero, of course, is one of the companies that they make Wi-Fi routers and they have uh, said that they had thread support for a really long time. And you could turn it on and off in the um, in the app. And uh, when you went to like add a thread device, then it would pop up and say, you know, read a QR code or put a QR code in front of it. Um, and then over on Android, there is a thread commissioning app that lets you gain access to your thread network as long as you have the password um, to your thread network. And so for the longest time, I would launch that app and I would see my HomePod mini as a thread network. Um, and it would show its IPv6 and IPv4 um, addresses as options. But when you tap on it, it asks you to type in the password. And we don't know what that password is right now. Um, and so I wasn't able to gain access to it. Well, the HomePod mini, as the only thread radio I have in my house, uh, was the only one that showed up. Or the only, I should say, border router in my house was the only one that showed up. But I thought, because this is kind of weird, because the Eero is supposed to also be a thread border router. So it should be showing up here too. And it never did. Well, today I hopped into the um, Android app and the Eero router was, were, was showing up because there are multiple. Um, so it seems like Eero slash Amazon is starting to lay the foundation for also adding uh, devices to a thread network, uh, which is interesting. So yeah, I'm definitely keeping my eyes peeled for all of that stuff. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, I've got my e my Eve app still only shows the Apple. Th it calls them Apple Thread routers and doesn't show the actual HomePod Mini thing. Um, but yeah, the that whole just like network connectivity thing is is still. I think it, it's just been so confusing because of like we. I mean, we even talked about Thread a lot too, and it it sort of won't be as present for most people. Uh, compared to matter. Um, and that will be like the logo that you see on the box and everything. So that will be a bit of a transition too, but at least what it actually does is just like amazing. Um, also I just remembered the other th Siri thing is that it's working, working locally on device. So it should be in theory even faster just to process those commands before it sends them. So having like super snappy smart home stuff is going to be amazing. And if, yeah, it does again, feels like too good to be true. <laughs> um, Let's see. So I will, I've saved the best announcement for last and this is just <laughs> purely me, me segment right here. Um, because it was funny too, because I, during the keynote, I was like, come on, Apple, you gotta, um, he got to talk about Siri at some point with shortcuts and they weren't doing that. And that's because they had saved a segment of the keynote where they announced shortcuts for Mac, which is super awesome. Um, this is just like mind blowing because I always figured that they were going to do it, but I had no concept of just like what that'd take or what would finally make it possible. Um, it does seem like just from t comments I've seen on Twitter that they built it all in Swift UI. And so that was one of the, that's what I just always remembered was just that shortcuts was very much iOS because it was using all of those specific APIs that were, I don't know if they were easier or some of just like GPS are just not, that's not on the Mac at all because it's just not a feature. Um, but so they built the whole, I think most of the app using Swift UI, which means that it shares a code base with the iPhone and iPad app, which just means it's going to be easier to update than creating an, a whole new version that was just on some of the older Mac technologies. Um, but some really cool things is that it basically means almost all of the actions will work on Mac out of the box. There's some like obviously specific iPhone ones that won't. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it's all beta software right now. So there might be some other, like I wanted to get the device details of the Mac and check the screen size because, um, and that doesn't work, but, there's actions for finding your 
browser window or finding your windows and then resizing them. And so a big thing that you can do with shortcuts is like put your Safari tab in the middle and then Twitter down the side and music on the other side or something like that. You can have sort of your whole custom setup on your Mac right away. Um, the shortcuts can run from the menu bar, which is super cool. So you can kind of have that quick to access. And then there's also the services menu, which is when you right click on something on the Mac down at the bottom of the menu there, there's a services additional menu that provides sort of um, like share sheet stuff from iOS, but on a, in a very Mac way, which has a lot of low level stuff that kind of doesn't work from the share sheet. Otherwise, um, it is very weird that there's actually no share sheet shortcuts in the same way. It's only those quick actions or the menu bar. Um, so that's a little odd because that's sort of how I expect it to work from iOS. Um, there's also no automations, which is a bit of a bummer. I'm pretty sure if you know what you're doing, you could automate it all still using the terminal um, because there's also a command line utility for shortcuts where you can do like dash view shortcuts and then by the name and it'll open it in the app or you can run it. And so I'm, I'm not like an actual terminal developer or anything like that. So I don't know how to schedule cron jobs to run and do this kind of thing. But in theory, you could use the existing features to schedule your shortcuts using stuff like that. Um, but shortcuts itself also, it's replacing um, Automator on the Mac. And also, I don't know about replacing Apple Script, but it's integrating all of those things um, that if you did past Mac automation, you still want to be able to do and not just like get left in the dust with something new with shortcuts. But um, Apple very much said shortcuts is the feature of automation on the Mac, yeah. which was a really good line just to hear. So we don't have to question it anymore. Um, and just that they're committed to it. So that stuff is really awesome. Um, other features like you can get, they, they basically took everything that was in automator and made it available in shortcuts so that, there was just some sort of way to transfer over. And so some of what Automator could do is like get the current URL from Safari, which is actually, I think, an omission um, right now from iOS as well. It should be able to get all of the tabs because Safari has a whole new tab grouping system. And so like being able to get all the links out of there and we'll act on them is something that people have constantly asked for. And I don't, I don't know why we don't have it yet, especially now that it's on the Mac. Um, but one of the big changes is being able to interact with the Finder and the Files app in a deep way. Whereas before, you could only look at the shortcuts iCloud folder. Like any other app can only look at its own iCloud container and can't like grab all your data. Um, but now with shortcuts, you can set up a whole file management workflow. And specifically for me as a video creator, this is actually like a big part of the process is importing, renaming, tagging, organizing in specific ways. And so now you could have um, a whole graphical interface to build a script to automate that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of this has been possible with tools like Better Touch Tool or Keyboard Maestro or through the command line and things like that. Um, but just bringing shortcuts to the Mac means that it will, at least for people like me who don't actually want to code, I just want to build the program you can do that without getting into that lower level stuff. And one of the really cool things is just that you can build automations that work across all the platforms. So for me, it's there's sort of this relief of um, a lot of people wanted like Final Cut Pro and Xcode for the iPad this year. And there's the whole story of just like, can the iPad be good for real work? And I, I just sort of don't have to deal with that anymore because now I can work on the Mac also. I can do all my stuff on all the platforms. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's, it fits nicely into what Apple's strategy at least currently is, where it, it really is like the Mac is that main platform and the iPad is a really good bridge between that and the phone. But there isn't some of those like super deep pro creative workflows on there. Um, and now I can just be like, well, I'm just going to automate Final Cut. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> That's nice for me, at least. Um, and just I think for a big thing with shortcuts was just like people are like, I would use that, but I do my work on the Mac. And so I'm not going to be able to get into this. If you did get into it, now you're just set up because you understand how to use shortcuts for Mac. And it's pretty much all the same. Um, they did redesign it so it's all a lot more compact and you can collapse subsections in shortcuts. So like 
something that I do commonly is make one menu that's really like seven shortcuts, but all combined into one. And just looking at it can be really confusing when it's just a giant list with like seven different segments. And so you can sort of, sort of collapse each, each section and see what's going on there. Um, yeah, there's just some like programming quality of life things in there or, um, yeah, just like clarity stuff. So that's been, it's really nice. Um, the last awesome thing, or there's actually two more features that are super relevant to the iPad and also a big thing with WWDC was just sort of cross-platform software for Apple. Like a big trend this last year is um, um, all of the new Macs are built off the M1 chip, which is also what's in the iPad. And so there's a lot of features that are just now coming to iPhone, iPad, and Mac all at the same time as opposed to separate platforms getting separate features. Um, one of them is a focus mode. And so this is re relevant to shortcuts because... And it, it's, it gets to be a bit of a stretch, but it's relevant to, I'll say, a power user, crazy person like me, <laughs> where I've been building like 15 home screens on the iPhone and iPad, or on the iPhone primarily, um, but knowing that I was going to eventually bring it to the iPad. And then iPad this year got widgets on the home screen. And so I have already gone completely overboard and put all of my shortcuts, they're all in um, widgets now, but... I've got 15 home screens of widgets with shortcuts in them. And, and, and even just the whole smart display thing that we've talked about on this show a lot, I was like, man, the iPad really is turning into an even smarter display because with those focus modes, you can set it to only show specific home screens. And so oh, like right now, that's cool. I, yeah, this is great. Um, I'm in my podcasting home screen and it's only got my podcasting shortcuts on up in big widgets that I can see all throughout the home screen and the apps that I need and it hides everything else. I only get notifications from you or Slack, which is what we use to communicate behind the scenes. And so like, it's, this is great. Even on the That's first really day. Neat. Yeah. Like, um, I have a group chat with Rosemary Orchard and some other people who talk about shortcut stuff. And I was like, I mean, not no offense to them, but I was like, I just missed this whole conversation because I was watching a WWDC video in my reading mode and it like muted everything. And I was like, it actually really helped me focus as opposed to getting distracted and just talking about all the fun stuff. Um, but even just as a smart home thing is it's like there's like a TV mode. And so your iPad even just doesn't light up when you're watching TV when it's standing over in the corner or like it can automatically set the scenes it can be set using shortcuts and automations as well so that it can just be triggered at any time. Um, I still haven't even really processed what it means on the Mac specifically because there isn't that much of a home screen thing, but just being able to sh show my certain shortcuts or something like that would be pretty awesome. I even just remembered that somebody, I, I forgot about this all day today and I st now I'm going to go play with it afterwards. Shortcuts for Mac can be, because it can be triggered from Apple scripts or keyboard shortcuts, you could have a stream deck set up to run all of your shortcuts now, which is super cool. So you could have physical buttons on your computer to run shortcuts, which I've always wanted. Um, oh yeah, and then the last just peer feature is that shortcuts can open apps into split screen or slide over on iPad and on the Mac as well. Um, but so even for a big thing in the sort of power community is wanting app pairs where it's like, when I'm researching the show, I want the news and Instapaper next to each other. And it can open it up and even show which side is on which. And if it's in two-thirds or one-third view or like open Twitter and, and pop over if I want to get distracted. Um, so there's just tons of really cool quality of life improvements and getting your device set up just the way you want it. Um, and like shifting your contacts and having... And you could use all of the HomeKit integrations that when you shift contacts, like the lights change colors and everything too. So it's wild. That's very cool. Um, and there's tons that they can do with it too. Like every Mac app on the App Store, you can use the same technology to build their shortcuts that they do on iOS. So it's just easy. And also like we should get automations from Mac only apps that can be run through shortcuts in the future too. So... It's super cool stuff, and I can't wait to see what people do with it. That's the uh, Apple developer yes. line. So. 
Nice. I'm like out of breath because I'm so excited. I made a video and I told, I will admit, I chickened out with the intro where I literally, because I removed it later, but I was literally just jumping around my room going, shortcuts for Mac, shortcuts for Mac. Oh yeah, nice. <laughs> still there. <laughs> That's It's exciting though. It's just, I, I thought we were going to get Final Cut for iPad and instead we got shortcuts for Mac. And I was like, hey, I'm better. I'm more happy with this because I already use Final Cut on the Mac. So like, I'm going to actually, you all want me to automate anything that you do on the Mac now too. let me know and I'll, I'll try to dig into it. Um, even just a very cool thing is I use shortcuts to tap into web APIs and that's something that was just not approachable to me through any other interface. And so Mac users can use shortcuts to automate things like your Slack um, community or like your um, Airtable database or something like that. And that kind of stuff is just, the power of computers and now it's on my actual computer too which is pretty funny that i couldn't do that before i could only do it before on my ipad like i was joking this morning i might be the only person out there who's trying to figure out if i can use a mac to get my real work done <laughs> because i yeah, do it on the I ipad that. and i can't otherwise <laughs> I, th- I thought that was pretty funny um folks that yeah have always gone the other way with it so that was a pretty pretty funny thing um all right uh did we miss anything there? Anything else that you want to to talk about that uh, cropped up for you yeah. that was very exciting? One, just the last thing that was pretty cool that they demoed was um, for M1 Macs and iPads, there's a continuity feature where you can literally take your mouse from the, the Mac and drag it off to the edge of the screen where your iPad would be, and it will so basically cool. transfer so cool. it over to the, yeah, over to the iPad and start like using the cursor there and then you can pick up an image or something like that, drag it back onto the Mac and it'll just sort of pop over. And then just to be fancy, he also puts an iMac on the other side and can move it from one across both displays onto the other (laughs) computer. And so it was, it's just very futuristic type thing. And I mean, I personally, I just want to have one keyboard and mouse at my desk because I sit down and I have to like switch them all around or have these ones that switch between Bluetooth. And if I could just use the same keyboard and mouse and go do something on the iPad real quick and even use it all naturally there and switch back, it really, I just really see, you can just sort of see the whole flow with Apple devices where it's like you're doing something on your phone and then you like pick up the iPad to, draw on it or whatever and then drag that to the Mac and so it can kind of just that seamlessness seems really awesome and if you have your shortcuts set up across the whole thing like oh, I'm going to have like 2,000 shortcuts within like three weeks or something <laughs> like that it's bad <laughs> like I they really should have added I need, you need a folders. shortcut for your shortcuts <laughs> yeah I mean oh I do trust me um, it doesn't yeah. help because it just has 700 shortcuts in it to run so it's like <laughs> That's why the the iPad thing really is going to be like amazing for me because I do have that paradox of choice. And so just focusing in on what you need to and changing the environment around you as you do it, it's like, I don't know anything that's smarter. Like what else, what else do I even want at this point? I don't know. <laughs> I guess I just want the home kit things to actually work. So hopefully matter will fix that. <laughs> Fingers crossed on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, up next are our picks of the week. It's time for our picks of the week. I think I'll start this week uh, to give sure. Matthew a chance to breathe. Um, <laughs> so I talked about the Akara. Oh, crud. Somebody somebody sent me something that told that me how me. I was actually. That was me. What was it? How's it pronounced? I, I'm pretty sure you just pronounced it correctly right there. But- Akara. I could be wrong. Let's let's double check. Yeah, because I think we were saying like Aquara. Yeah, I think it's Aquara. So anyway, the um, Aquara Smart Hub and the the whole Aquara system, and it was um, the hub itself 
is a device that you plug into the wall and then it Wi-Fi connects to your home network. And it serves as the Zigbee hub, uh, or the Zigbee bridge between your home Wi-Fi network and the different Acara devices that you put in your house. So Rosemary Orchard uses this uh, for a vibration sensor for her uh, washing machine. I have one of those as well. And then I keep looking up to the right because I have a button on the wall that turns on and off the different lights in my office. So when I walk in, the light switch is right there. The button is right there. I press it once to turn on all of the lights that I need for my studio uh, setup. Uh, press it twice to turn them all off and then press and hold to turn on what I just call night light, which is just some lights that I might need at night when I come into my office for whatever reason. Um, and while I loved having that button, the problem with it was something I brought up, which is that Yes, people don't want to have bridges uh, connected to their router, and some people don't have enough room to add more bridges to their router. But I vastly prefer having a bridge connected to my router to the other option, which is to have it be Wi-Fi connected, because that's one more jump that the device has to make. That's one more uh, chance for it to be slowed down. That's one more chance for things not to work how you want them to. So Akara came out with a new... Uh, hub called the Akara Smart Hub M2, uh, available for about fifty-eight bucks in the apps in the App Store uh, on Amazon, and it is uh, HomeKit enabled, just like the the last one. It also has um, IR. Uh, an IR blaster or several IR blasters built into it. So you can set it up around where you have things that you might want to turn on with it, which is kind of nice. But the biggest thing about this, the reason why I got it is because you can plug it in over Ethernet to your router. So it is much more responsive. It becomes more like a Philips Hue device in that way uh, because it has... Um, because it has Ethernet connection instead of having to jump over Wi-Fi to uh, to do those connections in your home. So yeah, it's um, it's it's nice. It's just a little black hub that almost looks like kind of a um, well, yeah. It's, I don't know what else. To, it's it's almost like an old style, old school Echo. That's what I was uh, mm -hmm. Echo Dot, and uh, it's got speakers on the bottom for the little pairing now stuff. And as I said, IR blasts all the way around and the ethernet is on the back. Plug that in and you're good to go for uh, Zigbee connecting to the different Akara devices you have in your home. So yeah, if you are looking for uh, a way to add some kind of tiny devices to your house of all sorts, uh, this might be what you want to check out as well as um, adding that IR blaster to your home. So if you've got like tower fans or other things that have remotes connected to them, this is a great thing to try out or maybe some old school um, home theater equipment that needs to have that kind of connection. This is great for that. But Akara makes a bunch of different little IoT devices for your home. Mm. So you can use this with that, which makes it great. Um, nice. Yeah, Akara Smart Hub M2. All right, Matthew, what is your pick of the week? My pick is a Home Run 2, which came out last week while I was gone, but I wanted to mention it just because it's a super handy, um, basically shortcut system for setting up different scenes for your home devices and then having quick triggers to them. Um, one of the kind of frustrating things about HomeKit is that it doesn't have native widgets. And so one of the things that they added is just the ability to... The Home Run was generally an Apple Watch app before, um, and you could open the app and do it, but now it... And trigger things, but now it actually has the widgets. Although now that I think about it, widgets do need to open the app. Um, so I think that's one of the things that people were kind of commenting about WWDC this year is there's no like sort of widget kit framework that would make widgets interactive without opening the app. Um, so I guess this will actually open it whenever you trigger those, but that's still fine. Um, and just on the Apple Watch too, it has a lot of complications and ways so that you can have a specific complication show up at a certain time of day, like as opposed to needing a different watch face for a different type of day with s single complications on there, like just whatever your bottom left complication could show morning, evening things, depending on time of day all through the um, home run interface, which is pretty nice. So yeah, this is kind of just like a 
HomeKit accessibility feature thing as Apple doesn't necessarily make it super easy to set that up in a super custom way throughout all your devices. Um, and it's four ninety nine for an annual subscription or twenty dollars for the whole thing, for permanently, which is nice. And yeah, um, Aaron Pierce also does tons of like Home Pass, Home Scan, um, different HomeKit utilities. So I don't I don't have the bundle up in front of me, but I think you might be able to get this with those other ones for like cheaper than separately, which is nice. Nice. Uh, yeah, we we love all of uh, Aaron Pierce's. Apps, they're fantastic. Yeah, I just used uh, the home okay. pass today to add the Acara code to my uh, to my <laughs> system. Yeah, especially as I've gotten more um, just like from Eve and stuff like that for review purposes. It's like, yeah, I need to keep track of these. And I'll put um, a link into the show notes too. He did a good summary of um, that smart home developer session since he's like the main smart home <laughs> uh, developer there that I know of at least. Especially for TVOS, he's been doing a lot of yes. um, like video camera on the TV thing, which is now supported as well, um, but still good. All righty. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of Smart Tech Today. Uh, we will have to have a, another questions episode soon. Uh, so send those in, stt at twits.tv to check it out. Um, we record new episodes every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Pacific. Uh, so you can check it out live and hang out with us going to twit.tv slash live. Uh, but the best way to get the show is by subscribing to it, which you can do by going to twit.tv slash stt and subscribing in audio or video. Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you are, we are, or most everywhere you are, we are, and we are ready for you to subscribe there. Um, by the way, we are super pumped that uh, Club Twit is rocking it, and uh, we'd love for you to join us, be a part of the Club Twit experience. For seven bucks a month, you get all of our shows ad free, uh, plus you get access to a Twit Plus bonus feed that has content you won't find other places as well as what's uh, definitely the most popular part of this, access to the members-only Discord server. Yes, folks love the members-only Discord server where you can hang out uh, amongst other club Twitters and also hang out with us. We uh, love having you there. And uh, you can find all of that by going to twit.tv slash club twit um matthew castanelli if folks want to check out all the great work you're doing and follow you online where do they go to do so uh go to youtube.com slash matthew castanelli where i just put up a couple of days ago a quick reaction video that i mentioned earlier and i'm going to be doing more coverage of all of the ipad stuff that is coming out and shortcuts so i can the sky's the limit now i can do mac videos and get away with it it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, I am online at Micah Sargent on many a social media network, or you can go to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to many of the places I'm most active online. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that takes care of it. So it's time to say good afternoon to all of your smart assistants now that they're all working together. Group hug, smart assistants. Group hug. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop, it's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like Leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon. <laughs>